Um, I'm happy to introduce Alex Cates from Northwestern University. He'll be speaking on gaze behavior changes following motor learning in a gait training task. There we go. Sorry, muted there. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, as mentioned, I'm going to talk about gaze behavior and how it changes following some motor learning in gait training. Um, so to start off, I just want to go through what is gaze behavior. Um, so gaze behavior is basically where you look, and in particular, it's where you're looking when you're trying to accomplish some sort of motor task. Um, for me, I study that in walking. Um, and so this captures where an individual looks, it's how much time they spend looking at different locations. Um, and the really nice way to show this is the distribution of fixations. Um, and it really informs sort of what visual information is sampled to accomplish the task. So it's an insight into what individuals are relying on to try to accomplish a task. Um, so I mentioned that you normally show it, or I like to show it as a distribution. Um, during walking, we tend to normalize this into the number of steps ahead someone is looking. Um, so when someone's walking on normal ground, you know, they might have a few obstacles. You know, can you imagine walking on the street or something like that? They'll be looking at a couple of different things, but there tends to be a distribution centered around two steps ahead. Um, and that, you know, it extends in all directions and whatnot, but that that sort of two-step tends to be a pretty standard thing in healthy adults. Um, in clinical populations or it, on different terrains, we see this shifted distribution where people tend to look a little closer to themselves. The fixation distance decreases so that they are emphasizing fixations that are closer to where their feet are going to land. So they're not planning as far ahead. Um, and what my project is really looking at basically is how do we learn our gaze behaviors? Um, so we see all these different distributions um, at these sort of endpoints. So older adults who struggle with um, balance and have gait deficits tend to have this diff change distribution, but we don't really understand how they get there. Um, so for me, what I wanted to do is try to understand that. So what I did is I used a sequence learning stepping task um, so participants walked on a treadmill while I projected a six step repeating pattern of steps um, of short, medium and long steps. These are all normalized to the participants um, average step length. Um, they completed 11 trial blocks, each of around 100 steps. Um, to make the task difficult enough, I had to actually increase the speed so their targets are moving faster than the treadmill. Um, they also received auditory feedback. Basically, if they stepped too far away from a target, they heard an error noise to make sure they were learning. Um, and to check that they were actually learning, I had a random catch trial at trial seven. Um, to give you a sense of what this looks like, this is sort of a GIF taken from some real data. Um, so what you can see is the participant's foot, they're stepping, each step is landing on a target. That's what those yellow blocks are. And we can see their gaze is sort of shifting back and forth between the two targets as they try to plan out and execute the steps accurately. Um, and what I'm really looking at is basically how their gaze distribution would shift as they learn the task, as they learn the sequence. Um, is their distribution going to shift forward indicating that they don't need to use as much immediate planning and they can sort of plan farther ahead as they learn the task? Or does it shift backwards, in which case they're really trying to rely on feedback control and um, accurately place their foot on every step? So what we see is uh, all, that they shift backwards, essentially. So I'll take you through this graph. In the blue, that's their average step error during a trial. So we've trial blocks along the x-axis. Um, step errors in the blue on the y. And we see our very classic sort of exponential decrease. Um, I'll say this is really just preliminary data right now. It's only five subjects. Um, I'm working on getting some more, but you know, coronavirus times makes that more difficult. Um, and then in the green, we see their fixation di distance. And a couple of things that are kind of interesting is that their fixation distance is kind of holding steady in the beginning. Um, and then there's this random catch trial 
um, where the sequence disappears and they they commit more errors. Um, and after that, there is when the fixation distance seems to drop. Um, so when I get to the end, that's someone I'd love to hear people's thoughts on, but a couple other points to help out. Um, so I did look about what's happening within the trial itself. So as every step is, are the participants gaze changing in each step? So a couple points around there. First, this one is kind of expected, but it's also really nice to see. Um, so if we look solely at the step following either a correct step where they accurately stepped on a target or an error step where they were too far away and got the feedback of that they misstepped, um, we see a really stark dif uh, difference in the distribution such that following an error, people look straight down at their feet. Um, that's kind of expected that you can, I always picture it as if you're walking along and like on the sidewalk and stub your toe on the sidewalk, every immediately what you do is you look down and think like, why has my foot, foot betrayed me? Um, so I think that's sort of what's going on there. Um, but interestingly, we can look at sort of how their fixation distance changes based on the number of correct steps in a row, in a row they complete. Um, and what we see is basically as they complete more correct steps, um, in the blue, particularly before that catch trial, um, the fixation distance actually increases with each successive correct step. Um, we see we have the random trial and it goes flat to almost negative where they're not trying to look farther ahead because and that might be because they don't know the sequence anymore. And then it slowly starts to recover after that random trial, but it's not at the same sort of slope that it was beforehand. Um, so putting it all together, um, like I said, it seems that overall fixation distance decreases with motor learning, particularly on block to block. Um, this would suggest that people are needing to spend more time fixating on the current step. Um, this is actually kind of in support of the current approaches that some gaze intervention studies are doing. Um, although though, so Young and Hollins is one that's, um, they're trying to intervene in older adults to have them change how they're looking to try and improve their gait. Um, Though they are not measuring the gaze changes at each subsequent point, it's still just before and after. So it's still lacking that sort of understanding of what's going on. Um, and then there's also this major shift happening after that random catch trial. And so I'm a little confused as to why that might be. I don't have a good idea of that. And I'd love to hear people's thoughts. A um, couple of theories that I have, it might be a loss of confidence, which so you can imagine that in the beginning, as they're getting more correct steps, they get more confident, they feel like they can look up and observe the rest of the world. Um, and then that would reset every time they make an error. They have the catch trial and they make a bunch of errors. And that, at that point, then they're no longer confident. Um, another theory I have is that the value of the different visual information is changing because as they learn the pattern, they may not need to look farther ahead to plan out their steps. They already know what steps are coming because it's all so patterned. Um, I don't really know the answer to these questions, but there are thoughts that I'm having. Um, so next steps for me, like I guess I'm working on getting more participants through here. Um, I'd love to, as a, in a follow-up study, to start changing the value of visual information, maybe by having the targets fade out or disappear at different points. Um, and then I also want to start testing in some clinical populations to try to understand how those groups are using this information. Um, so with that, I want to say thank you. Um, and thank you to my lab in particular, and my PI who's in the bottom left corner, Keith Gordon. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, please, everyone, do ask your questions. I'm going to jump in here straight away because uh, I'm very curious about the experimental setup. Um, and it is, uh, yeah, that random trial. Um, I haven't fully understood what exactly kind of happens in that trial, but have mm. you looked at like different recovery? Kind of durations because it seems like in this graph particularly just showed the green and blue one right that they don't really recover from that um, yeah so have you had kind of more trials are you planning to have more trials after this random trial um to see how long it takes for them to kind of trust the visual information again i think that is definitely something i'd love to do as, to, as a follow-up to this um yeah so the random trial i guess so What's happening there is, like I said, for all the other trials, there's this repeating six step pattern of targets. Um, and so it might be something like short, medium, short, long, long, medium. And is that um, the same in every trial? It's the same pattern in every trial except the random trial. So the random trial, that pattern disappears and it's a random sequence of short, medium and long targets. 
Um, and so that's sort of the sequence learning aspect that gets thrown off there. Um, but yeah, I do think it's interesting that they don't recover from that. And I'm, I, I'll say I've done one subject that I tried to extend it, but I was also through another random trial into that because I was looking at some other aspects too. Um, and so it didn't really seem to affect, but again, that's one subject. <laughs> cool, thank you. There is a question from one of our participants. Um, I've allowed you to talk, so if you want to ask a question yourself, you can do that. You'd have to unmute yourself first. Hi, I was curious, um, from the GIF, it seems like the center of the gaze is actually shifted to favor one foot in particular. And I was wondering if you thought this was a leg dominance effect or if there was some other explanation for it. And if you would observe the same thing if the steps on either side were asymmetric. Hmm. Um, that's a good question. I, I would say I don't, I haven't looked into it as a leg dominance effect. I'll say I've seen across different trials or participants this sort of I think this asymmetric it might be just like the little clip that I grabbed rather than something that's uh, consistent trial to trial, but I won't say that I've looked at it in any systematic way. So it might be something to look at. Um, by target steps were asymmetric. Um, do you... So I, I did an experiment where um, we were prompting people to take specific step lengths, but it was in a different kind of context. So I study split belt adaptation. Yep. So I'm wondering if they can, you know, they have their dominant leg or their favorite leg and they, you know, want, as long as they hit the right target, they'll hit the left target. So they really only need to focus on one target. And that yeah. was something my subjects reported doing my experiment where they were like, oh, I was really only focusing on one leg. Um, when both targets were the same length, because if I could do that one, I could replicate it on my non-dominant leg or on my other leg. But then if the legs had to do different things, then they couldn't do that anymore. And the task was much harder. That's interesting. I'm, I'm thinking now I've seen a study that looked at gaze behavior during cup stacking and actually found the similar thing where people focused their gaze on their dominant hand um, and were able to mostly mirror it with their non-dominant hand. Um, so there could be something there, but I won't say I've looked at it, so I don't know for this. Okay. Just but curious. it's definitely something to look at. I like it. Um, we're always very interested in what effect leg like, dominance might have on the way people walk. So it would be an interesting result. Thank you. I enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have one more small question. And please, audience, do feel free to jump in as well if there's anything else you want to know. Oh, no, for sure. I think you have asked a question here, actually. Um, do you want to unmute yourself and ask it? Yeah, actually, uh, when I see this give, I thought about like uh, in winter, then when it's very slippery, like how, like the value of the visual information in this hard uh, floor is very important. And I thought maybe we can uh, manipulate the value of the visual information to check your hypothesis here by making the steppings a bit harder than it's usual. So that was what I'm curious of. Like, because I thought myself that when it is winter and it's icy, like I, I am, I think, looking directly to my foot to yeah. decide whether I should step or not. How should I step? Like it is yeah, very so short I'll, gaze, not long at all. I'll say there's been studies that have looked at um, differences in terrain. Um, I don't know about icy terrain per se, but I do know of like rocky terrain. So you can almost going from like bouldering almost or something like that. Um, and they've found that in those scenarios, your gaze does shift backwards. Um, so you're looking down at your feet more to guide your foot. Um, so I would imagine something similar is going on in icy terrain. Yeah, I think so. Thank you very much. Um, I just have a quick question. You said right at the beginning um, that the target is faster than the treadmill. Yeah. Um, I didn't quite understand that, but so I can't really picture that in my mind. Can you explain that again, please? Yeah, yeah. So um, so basically, I set the treadmill at a constant speed that the participant's walking at. Um, and in some of my pilot testing, I had the targets matching the speed of the treadmill. So it would look like as you're walking along, you're normally hitting a target. Um, and basically, everyone was near perfect at doing that. They're, 
the the like the success rate was like 90 95 percent right from the get-go and i couldn't get any learning effect with that um and so to make it harder i actually have the targets moving towards the participant as they're walking forward so the targets are not actually perfectly matching the treadmill as if they're like painted onto the treadmill and said they're moving faster than the treadmill and coming at the participant. That makes sense, yes. Success rates in the 90s aren't so good for success.